Cool. Uh, you should have seen already online uh, that the midterm CTF has been released yesterday. You've got a week uh, until Wednesday. So get started on it. Um, shouldn't be too crazy. I think you all, uh, I think there's some good progress getting made on there. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, it's applying the steps and concepts that you've learned before in the class um, to solving some CTF style challenges. Any questions on that? Is the room extra empty because people are working on the midterm CTF rather than coming to class? Possible. It's hard for you to answer because you're actually here. So, what was that? Ah, who says you're not going to work on it now? Yes, I'm sure yourself in you know a week from now or two weeks when you're doing the networking assignment will be thankful that you uh, didn't pay attention to the networking stuff. But you'll have to learn it eventually, so you know. It's up to you. You're all adults. All right. Cool. Oh, uh, maybe it's St. Patrick's Day, but shouldn't then people not be here tomorrow? I don't know. Celebrating early, I guess. Cool. All right. Well, now we get into. Mm, Honestly, what's the most complicated uh, part of networking that we're going to be learning um, is TCP. So how TCP works. So somebody remind us what UDP added on top of IP. Yep, ports. The only concept that uh, UDP adds is ports. And we can actually verify this by looking at the actual um, bytes of what's in an IP header and how do we parse those bytes. So the first two bytes are the source port, the second two bytes are the destination port, then a message length and a checksum, and that's it. So with this, we can um, now send, rather than just sending data to an IP address, we're sending data to an IP address and a port. And then when they respond, they will respond back with our IP address and the port that it came from, so the source port. So those are flipped. And that's how they know uh, how to respond to us. Now, uh, what guarantees did UDP add on top of uh, IP? Are you guaranteed when you send an IP packet that it will get there? Are you guaranteed that the other side won't get two packets? Are you guaranteed that if you send packet A, then packet B, then packet C, that they'll receive it in that order of A, B, and C? None of that. You get literally zero guarantees. UDP adds nothing on top of IP except for this port. So that's how you can reason about this. So if you understand that IP um, doesn't guarantee delivery, doesn't guarantee any uh, anything about um, that the packet gets there, that multiple packets don't get there, that a packet isn't dropped, that the packets aren't changed in the network when it goes out. And so you can reason and think, hey, oh, the UDP header doesn't add any information to this IP packet. The only thing it adds is ports. So there's no way. So if an application wants those things, because some applications need them, they have to encode them themselves in the data of that packet. Cool. Then we get to TCP. So this uh, TCP runs, I'd say, Actually, I don't have a good number. I could make one up. I think like 80 or 90% of the traffic on the internet is probably TCP traffic. It would be my guess. And so TCP builds on top of IP, but gives us things that we really want from a networking protocol. It gives us the ability to have a connection oriented. Um, so rather than just sending data, like a single packet from one side to the other, we can say, hey, send this string this long string to the operating system. And then the operating system will figure out how to send that data and it will, um, TCP will, uh, it'll be reliable to some degree and we'll talk about exactly what that means, um, but it's a stream delivery service. So rather than thinking about things in terms of packets, even though it uses IP packets underneath, the application doesn't get a packet at a time. It gets, uh, it asks for data and it will get data that's available. And TCP will, this is maybe slightly, so it's not how, 
So can PZB guarantee that no packet is ever lost? Yeah, why not? Some of you are shaking your heads. Yeah, we're sending a packet literally from a machine that we control out into the um, wireless network to a router that we don't control that has to go to switches and other networks that we don't control, right? There's nothing PCP can do if Comcast has an outage and is dropping all packets. Like it can't magically guarantee that your packet gets there, uh, but what can it guarantee? So when we say no loss here, what do we mean? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, so we know if the other side got our packet or not. And that's the key detail here is we know if they've seen our packets or not. And so we can know for a fact that that other side saw the data and those da that data was not lost, right? When we send it, we don't know if it's ever gonna be received, but as we'll see, they have a way to, um, I guess a modern example for this would be like read receipts on text messages or whatever, right? So we know that the other side got our message. We can't guarantee they're going to respond again. We, we don't control that computer. We don't know what it's going to do, but we'll know that they saw our message. So no loss, similar thing, no duplication. We know when we send a, a string of bytes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, we know we will know when that other side gets it, that they will only get A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and that there won't be two A's or the order won't be flipped, um, that there was no transmission errors, that everything arrives in the correct order so that we, when we send a huge block of data, like a file or a web page or an image or a GIF or whatever, right? When you, when you send that, you know that the other side received exactly those bytes in exactly the right order and no bytes are duplicated. Cool. It also uses the concept of the port abstraction. So that's very useful for applications. So TCP also has this concept of ports. So you can think of it as TCP is UDP. So ports plus all these mechanisms that you need in order to guarantee these things that these uh, properties that we're talking about. And this is kind of the thing we're going to focus on. How does it actually provide a way to do this? And essentially the key concept in terms of TCP is it allows two nodes. So two IP addresses to establish a a virtual circuit or a virtual connection. And the core concept here of what defines a connection is a four tuple. So tuple, just a fancy word for like four items in a list, right? Uh, but it never changes, it's always four. The source IP, the destination IP, the source port and the destination port. So those four bits of information and it's a, a two-way connection. So when I send data from one side to the other, I'm always using the same source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port. When they send data back to me, they're sending the same thing, but flipped. So what was my source is gonna be their destination. What was my destination is gonna be their source. And so the IPs and ports are flipped. So this is why, as we'll see, it's important that um, ports, when you're creating a packet to send, because it's gonna come back and define that, that um, this tuple is unique. So you can't have multiple TCP connections. To, if you have multiple TCP connections to one system, like you're accessing google.com uh, through two different tabs in your browser, they will each, they'll have a diff, each TCP connection will have a different four tuple. So it will have, um, I think the only thing that'll be different because your IP remains the same, the destination IP remains the same, the destination port remains the same. The only thing that changes is your source port. Cool. So what we mean by two streams, yeah, so there's two circuits, right? One in each direction. And it just means that um, each side can send data to any other side at any point in this conversation. And as we'll see, there's even mechanisms for one side to say, all right, I'm done talking to you, but I'll keep list. I won't send you any more data, but if you want to keep talking to me, you can send me data. Uh, other words to help with your vocabulary that you'll see when you're talking about networking. This concept of an IP address port is often called a socket. 
And the two streams are called a socket pair because you have an IP port of the source, IP port of the destination. And um, when you're doing, when you get into network programming, you can look up things like uh, socket programming and those kinds of things. There's libraries and all operating systems of how to actually do this. Uh, because fundamentally, the nice thing about this is your application just can say, hey, give me any TCP traffic on port 80. So port 80 is the standard web HTTP port. And then the operating system will handle all the mechanisms that we're talking about of accepting new connections, negotiating with the other side. And then when it's established a connection, it tells your application, hey, I got a new application. I got a new connection for you. Um, here's ways that you can get data from it. And so you can receive data. You can send data on that socket. Um, so let's take a look at the headers again, just like we saw before. So what do we know for a fact is going to be different about this than UDP? It's going to be bigger. Yeah, that's a basic thing. But if we just think, OK, what we know other stuff has to happen. We fundamentally can't use the same header as UDP. There must be some kind of additional information here to keep track of these connections in this state. So, but we will have some of the same things, right? We still have the port abstraction, which means we must have source port, two bytes, 16 bits, destination port, two bytes, 16 bits. Now we'll have, and we'll see how these come into play because they're really important. We have a sequence number, and you can think of this right now as this kind of, so if you think about a stream from we've sent zero bytes up to we've sent two to the 32 bytes, the sequence number kind of tells us the data in this packet, where is it in this stream of data? We also have an acknowledgement number, and this essentially is a way, this is like the read receipt, where we tell the other side, hey, I've seen up to byte a thousand in the stream. And then that way, and this is, as we'll see, this is how, once you get this back, you know the other side has seen data that you've sent up to a certain point. You don't know anything after that, but once you get this back, you know for a fact they've seen your data. Um, we have some bytes for the header length because the unlike uh, UDP, which had a fixed size header, there's actually all kinds of crazy TCP options. Uh, some reserved things, some flags, which will um, be very important. We'll talk about um, some of the super important ones that you need to know. This is, you can think of, what is this? Uh, eight bits. So you know, these are just ones and zeros, and each one and zero in that eight bits signifies a different flag. So some will be a sin, some will be a sin, an ack. Uh, there's a push flag, I think, and those are the only ones I know off the top of my head. And I don't know where they are in there, so don't worry about. You don't have to know exactly what bit offset is each of these flags. The window we're not going to get into. Um, this actually deals with the problem of what if the other side doesn't have enough space to store all the data you're trying to send. So if you think about it, there's a huge stream, we're trying to send a gigabyte file to somebody, but their computer has limited resources, they, their operating system doesn't have enough space to store a gigabyte at once. So you have this way, this mechanism of describing the sliding window. Uh, I will say we're going to go over literally just the basics of TCP of how to establish a connection, how to send data. It is how it actually works is even more complicated than what we're going to get across because of things like the window, because of things like uh, how to deal with network congestion, how to deal with that fa fairly. So if you want to learn more about that, take one of the networking courses. I think you'll learn a ton in that. Uh, we have a checksum, an urgent pointer, which I think is almost never used, uh, multiple options, and then a padding to make sure we're on a byte boundary. And we have data. So honestly, for our purposes, the, you only actually need three things to get the reliability that we need. You need the sequence number, the acknowledgement number, and the flags. And that's actually it, which is kind of crazy to think about. That we can get all of those properties that we want. We can get the fact that um, we can send data as a stream and not as packets. We can. Um, we can know if our data if our data is getting to the other side or not. All these really cool things just with those three things: the sequence number, the acknowledgement number, and the flags. Questions on that? All right, let's see it in action. Oh, 
And just like before, right? To reinforce the onion model of networking, we'll have the actual, so the TCP data here will be the actual application level data. That will have a TCP header at the start. That will be placed inside of the IP data of the IP uh, diagram. That will have an IP header attached to it. And that at each hop along the way, will have that whole thing put as a frame data and you'll have the ethernet frame attached to the start. And again, just like before, right? To kind of check yourself, you know exactly what happens at each step along the way, right? This, uh, the ethernet frame basically completely goes away and a new one is constructed on each hop because it's different MAC addresses that the packet is going to. Um, and the only thing that gets changed in the IP header is the time to live gets decremented, uh, but the TCP header and TCP data remains exactly the same. What's the purpose of this TCP encapsulation? Um, let's see. I think I'd phrase it as the purpose is goes back to our diagram of uh, the networking. Let me uh, let me look here. Yeah. So the purpose is that. If you are writing link layer software, right? So you're writing a switch or something like that, you only ever have to worry about or think about the ethernet header, right? And maybe the IP with that time to live, but you have to do very little. You only need to look at the outside there and it's totally opaque. So if somebody comes up with a new application layer, uh, I don't know, ZCP or whatever you want to call it, right? Some new transport layer thing, you don't have to change anything else. You just change that and then everything else, all the switches will work 100% the same. Similar with the IP layer, right? We could change, we actually did change, right? We moved from, well, uh, we we're trying to move from IPv4 to IPv6. And this can happen because you don't have to change TCP or UDP. And you also don't have to change the link layer except for ARP stuff that has to translate between the two. So it's a nice um, it's a nice way of thinking about designing different protocols. Actually, I don't know if I'll get into this, but um, an insane thing actually happened in networking. So um, there used to be a predecessor to TCP called the NCP. Um, I think it's network control protocol. I mean, TCP is transmission control protocol, I believe. Um, do I even have that on the slides? Yeah, transmission control protocol. So before uh, TCP, there was a protocol called NCP, and it didn't have any of the congestion control issues. Uh, essentially, at a high level, what TCP does is when it's sending packets, if it detects that something got dropped, it actually significantly reduces the rate at which it sends packets. Because the problem is, if you don't do that and you've overloaded something and nobody stops transmitting, you'll keep losing packets and everyone has a massive problem. But if you significantly, like it's called the exponential delay, if you exponentially slow your sending rate, you can let the network recover and kind of everybody does that as soon as they detect a problem. And so it's actually a huge problem. Um, and I believe, I don't know the exact date. I think it was sometime in the eighties, uh, they kind of had this proposal said, hey, NCP is not working. We need to move to TCP. So they decided on one day uh, which was called the flag day. If you look this up on uh, Wikipedia, you can look up like the TCP flag day where they literally, everyone that was running a system on the internet on that day, shut down their system, updated the software to support TCP and then turned it back on the next day. So like they literally had to reboot the internet in order to get something like this working. Uh, and so that showed you the difficulty of upgrading and changing these things uh, because I believe it wasn't a backwards compatible change. So now if you think about uh, do you think you could do that in the internet today? Yeah, imagine if you're just like, nope, sorry, the internet's down for today. It, it like needs maintenance. Like you literally can't do anything. So, um, so now all the changes are basically have to be backwards compatible. All right, let's go to, okay. So TCB, so, what are these sequence and acknowledgement numbers for? Let's go through an example. Yeah, okay. I think it's actually easier to start here. Uh, you all cannot see my screen. 
prepared for this eventuality? All right. And how do I get you to go away? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, software. Boom, 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 boom. Hide library. There we go. All right. Thanks. Okay. TZB connection. So think about this conceptually first before we even start. How do you get the property that some that you know that somebody else knows something? And you just magically know it. If I send data to you, how do I know that you've received that data? Yeah, you have to tell me back, right? I need a, I need a response from you that says, hey, I got, I got your data. We're all good. At that point, then I know for certain that you have it. But if I don't get that reply, I can't just send data and magically hope that, uh, that you're there. So the very first thing we need to do in TCP, unlike UDP, where we can just send a packet and if that server is up or not, we don't really care. There may be, they will maybe reply to us, maybe not. We have to, before we start talking TCP, we need to know that that system is actually up and wants to talk to us. So think conceptually. So from my perspective, I'm the client. I'm going to make a connection to google.com. So actually, we know what will happen is uh, we'll make a UDP request to DNS to say, what's the IP address of google.com? It'll tell us something. Let's say it's 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. <laughs> So I now want to send a TCP packet to port 80 because I know that's the HTTP port of the IP address 8.8.8.8. .8 I know my IP address. So I first need to ask, hey, do you have anything running on port 8.8.8.8, or sorry, IP address 8.8.8.8, port 80? So I have to send, so conceptually, I have to send a packet to Google to ask them that because I'm trying to initiate the connection. I'm the client, they're the server. So I say, hey, do you have anything running there? Right. Does Google have anything running on port 80? Do they have a website? Do they run HTTP? Yes, you go to their websites all the time. They, um, even though they're almost exclusively on HTTPS, they still have something running on port 80 to tell you to go check out the HTTPS version. But regardless, they will then get that message and say, oh, great, somebody wants to connect to me. The operating system will check. Is something listening on port 80 for TCP? If not, it either drops it or sends a response saying, hey, go away, nothing's here. Um, 443 is, the, uh, is HTTPS port, not, not necessarily SSL. Um, and okay, so, uh, and so Google gets it. They say, okay, great. I, I have something running on port 80. So now Google needs to reply back that says, okay, I got it. Like I am listening. And I want to start a conversation. So Google replies back to us. We get that reply from Google. So now what do we know at this point? That Google is ready, that Google is listening. There's something listening on port 80 on that IP address and that it wants to talk to us. What does Google know? Google knows it wants to talk to us. Do they know if we turned off our computer at that point? Do they know if that packet was lost somewhere? Right, fundamentally, no. This is why it requires, this is a, a way you can reason about how many packets are required to start up a TCP connection. You need three. I'm gonna say, hey, uh, are you listening? They say, yes, I am. And you go, yes, I got your yes, I am. And then at that point, once both sides have got all those that, that information, you know that the other side is up, available, and good to go. And how that works is with flags. So we need a TCP flag in the header that says, uh, hey, I would like to start a conversation. So the, um, oh, it's called the SYN flag. I think it stands for synchronize. Like, hey, let's synchronize our state or our connection or something like that. Um, I actually never really refer to it ever by the full name, except when I'm doing this in class and then I forget until the next time I teach this. So uh, you can just call it a SYN, the SYN flag. Um, you can think the other way this is referred to is a TCP packet with the SYN flag set is just called a SYN packet. So uh, client 
server. So at the start, the client will send a uh, send TCP packet with the SYN flag. So if you look at the header, you'd see that that byte of the, the flags that represents the SYN flag is set to one. And I believe all the other flags are set to zero. So we can do this a little bit more. So we can send, send TCP packet. Uh, let's do my client here will be 10. Dot, yeah. And the server here will be 8.8.8.8, which is kind of wrong because that's their DNS IP address, but it's really easy to remember. So, so send the TCP packet. So we can actually go through layer by layer, right? So at the TCP layer, so what's the um, so what's the source IP at the TCP layer? What? Oh, it's a trick question. There is no IP addresses at the TCP layer. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I hate doing that, but sometimes you got to do that. Okay. So the only things that are at the in the TCP layer that we care about is the source port. So our operating system will actually generate a random source port. So we'll call it 4242. Destination port. What's the port we're trying to talk to? What was that? Port 80. And at this point, all we need is flags. So the only flag set is the SYN flag. And then we can look at the IP layer. So uh, source IP is 192.168.0.1. Destination IP is 8.8.8.8. I don't think there's any more information we need there. And then we can further kind of keep going and say what's the ethernet frame but we don't need to go through that every single hop because you understand what what is happening uh, from here cool so this packets get sent okay the server receives the packet the server will first check hey do i have anything listening there if not tell you to go away so now the server gets this. They respond. So what's the um, so the TCP uh, responds with TCP. So the TCP layer source port. What will the source port be? Port eighty. How do you know that? Yeah, it's just a flip. The destination port that we're sending to, when the other side responds to us, their destination will be their source. So destination port will be 4242 flags. So this is uh, what we'll go to in a second. We'll come back to this because uh, this is actually just part of the protocol. Nothing that you can reason about here. Uh, okay, so we have that. And the source IP will be 8.8 destination IP. IP will be 192.168.0.1. All right. So now this is part of the protocol. So part of, and this is, there's a, these three packets here are very important to burn into your brain. These are a very, very, very standard thing of networking. And it's very, it's the way to remember exactly what flags are set. So the first flag is the SIN by the uh, just a SYN packet from the client to the server. Then the server responds with a SYN and an ACK flag. Um, it stands for acknowledgement and it means that the acknowledgement number field is valid. We'll get to exactly what that's doing here in a second. But for now, all you need to know is the flags. So you send a SYN, the server responds back with a SYN ACK. And then can we respond back with a SYN? No, we kind of shouldn't because this is a special thing that indicates, hey, I want to start a connection. So a flag with just a sin says, hey, I want to start a connection. And the server will say, hey, go away. We're already in the middle of starting a conversation. So it'll restart the whole thing because it's like, I don't like, basically the way you do networking protocols is anytime anything is, is weird that you don't expect, you say, all right, I don't know what you're talking about. Let's start from scratch. Like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. If you want to talk to me, you got to start with the sin at the beginning and then we'll go. Okay. Yes, 
principal. Uh, responds with TCP packet. So then we'll respond back. Again, we'll have source port uh, 4242, destination port 80 flags. So I won't have the send flag, but I will have an acknowledge flag. So this is how you can um, source port, source IP 192.168.01, uh, destination IP is 8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. So this is the sin, sin ack. These are the three packets. If you have these three packets, you have an established connection at this point. And now, and it's this is kind of the insane thing. Only at this point can you actually start sending data, right? So you can't even talk to the other side or begin talking to the other side until you've gone through the sin, sin ack. ack. Questions on the high level process? Cool. So that's at least how we can kind of boot, uh, get the process started. So get the, the connection going. The, what we need to do is we need to be able to use the sequence and acknowledgement numbers in order to tell the other side, hey, what's, uh, what byte are you going to start sending data from? Or um, uh, so, so we need a way in order to uh, we need to bootstrap something so that we each side can know what data they've been sending and what data the other side has received. Uh, does that have anything to do with the end-to-end -end encryption on our messages? No. The, um, the way encrypted uh, messaging has to get set up is much more complicated than this. Um, you have like TLS or SSL has a whole addition. You have to first establish a TCP connection and that protocol has to establish uh, encryption. They have to negotiate on what ciphers and protocols and everything they're gonna use. And then they can actually, and they need to exchange keys and then they can actually communicate. It's kind of crazy, but. Um, so there's way more in depth in here for all these things, but uh, the basics here are TCP, but it all has to start here. Okay, so we know we need to send, we need to send ACK and an ACK. So the other thing, so the other thing is we need to establish the sequence and acknowledgement numbers. Um, so, uh, you could think of this sequence number starting at zero technically, and we'll see why each side actually generates a random 32-bit value, well, roughly random 32-bit value for the sequence number. And you can think of that as just starting and everything else is an offset, right? So you start at that byte, and then every time you send, you're saying, hey, I've seen up until this point, but it's kind of arbitrary. So right now we'll just call it a sequence client. So you can think of it as starting at zero, doesn't really matter. The client first says, and the acknowledgement uh, you'll see what I mean when I talk about pseudo random. I'm actually referring more toward to the uh, different implementations. And actually, the crux of the security here, which I'll hint at, depends on the randomness of the sequence number. So I'm making a connection. And again, the, uh, the only time this, the acknowledgement number is valid is, valid is when there's a, a, an ACK flag set. So if I send a packet, like a SIN packet that doesn't have the acknowledgement flag set, it means that I don't care about what the value is in that uh, header. So let's go back and look at the packet. Yeah, so we can see we've looked at here. Hello. Uh, source port, destination port, sequence number, and acknowledgement numbers. They're both 32-bit, uh, four-byte uh, values. OK. Now. So we're going to expand this packet. So we have uh, the sequence. So now, and the other way actually to think about the sin packet, the sin packet is setting this side sequence number. So this is basically the client's way of saying, hey, I'd like to talk to you. And when I talk to you and send you data, I'm going to start sending from sequence client. 
the server says, great, I want to talk. Uh, and I'm going to use sequence server in order to send you data, right? Because it's a two-way street. They can each send data at any point in time once they're established. And then the acknowledgement is acknowledging the sequence of the client plus one. Um, so when you're acknowledging back, you're saying, hey, I got your message. And finally, on the last one, the so sequence number here is going to be sequence of client plus one. The acknowledgement is going to be sequence of server plus one. Let me double check this uh, to verify that this is correct. I'm 90% sure. Oh no, how do I? Boop, boop. Yep, okay, that's correct. Cool. So these plus ones may seem. Oh. Maybe I should just see how long I can lecture to an empty screen. All right. Uh, oh, okay. So sequence of cl uh, client plus one, sequence of server plus one. So the um, <laughs> the real reason why this is done, and this may seem <clears throat> counterintuitive, is. Uh, it's kind of a question of, so this is a 32-bit number. You guys have taken computer architecture, right? So you have four bytes here, 0 through 8, 8 through 16, 16 through 24, 24 through 32. Which is the most significant byte? It depends on the endianness. Yeah, so the most significant byte Remember, there's four bytes. So the most significant byte could be zero through eight, the smallest, or it could be 28, uh, 24 through 32 or 31. Those, the most significant byte could be here. So the way to think about that is um, so if you have a number, let's say one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, right, in hex. So reminder of hex, each of these represents a byte. So we have the byte 44, the byte 33, the byte 22, the byte 11, right? So this is the number. This represents the number uh, of whatever. Uh, we'll do it here. OK. So 33 is 51. Right, and uh, so this number is one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, which represents the integer, whatever this is. I don't know. What's that? I always got to do the. Oh, that's apparently a phone number too. Cool. It's helpful. Okay. The question is for this number, how do we represent it in memory? Right. So some systems will represent it exactly like this, whereas other systems will flip the bytes around and will represent the number as four, four, three, three, two, two, one, one. Uh, this actually will come up also later when we do exploitation of binaries. Um, so it's not an obscure concept. And so uh, I believe most modern CPUs use little endian like this, where the lowest the lowest byte in memory has the most significant is the most significant byte in the in terms of the number and basically like the CPU when it grabs stuff from memory it just like flips it around and then computes on it and I don't know I don't understand hardware but there's probably a reason why that's uh, actually used whereas um, network packets so network packets in here uh, in TCP these are actually big Indian numbers so the most significant byte will be uh, 0 through 8, I believe, not 30, 24 through 31. Uh, the point is that it's different, and different machines have different endianness. So uh, if I want to just reply, 
So what is, so when I get something from the other side that has my sequence of the client plus one, so the client gets that back, it receives this packet, the client knows the sequence number of the client that it originally sent. It checks if that's one more than that. What does that tell us about the other side? Yeah, it would tell us if they know, understand the protocol correctly, right? Because um, do they actually know that this sequence number is big Indian or little Indian, right? Because they have to do the conversion or not, depending on their own architecture. So the fact that I can detect this by the second packet, because think about what do you have to do if you're not doing this and you're just responding with the sequence of the client, does that mean you can actually interpret that number? If you just respond with the sequence of the client, how would you write that code? Just like copy this number from this part of what I got and send it here, put it here in the reply, right? You're just copying bytes from one place to the other. You're not actually interpreting that as a number that you need to be able to increment because if they can't do that, then one side will say, oh, I sent you one byte. And the other side says, whoa, you sent me, a, I don't know, whatever a two to the 24 bytes is. And they'll get very, very confused very quickly. So this is a nice, clever way to determine that just in the handshake part of the TCP, establishing the connection that both sides essentially are talking the same language. Because if the client gets back anything except for the sequence of client plus one as the acknowledgement in this packet, it drops it. It says, all right, let's stop this conversation. Like, I don't know what you're doing, but I don't want to talk to you anymore. Something went wrong. Okay, cool. That was a quick uh, aside into endianness. And so now, uh, oh, cool. So these are the list of the flags. So we have uh, sin. So that's what we talked about. So sin, sin, ack, ack. Uh, ack is, means that the acknowledgement number is valid. And as we'll see, almost all uh, packets in the connection have the acknowledgement flag set. Uh, fin is a flag that gets set to shut down one stream. So if you want to stop talking to the other side, you send a packet with the fin packet set, and that basically tells the other side, this is the last packet you'll see from me, a uh, data packet. Reset, RST, uh, I guess I did actually remember most of these. Um, reset is super important. It says, hey, like when something goes catastrophically wrong, this is your way to say the other side, hey, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm stopping this communication. So the, a reset basically from either side tears down that virtual circuit and says, we can no longer talk anymore. If you want to talk to me, you got to start from the beginning and do a sin back in. Uh, urgent, I've never seen that. A push is sometimes set, but I don't actually know if it's technically used, uh, so we don't need to worry about that. Okay, so what are we setting up? So like we mentioned, a server listening on a port gets a connection request from a client. And so we know that that has a SIN flag set and has a random initial sequence number of the here S lower uh, S sub C. The server says, aha, uh, I will send you a packet back, um, a sin and ack packet with its own, the server's initial random sequence number and the sequence number of the client plus one is the acknowledgement number. And then the client, when it receives that, sends a packet with this ack flag back with the sequence of the client plus one and the sequence of the server plus one is the acknowledgement. Cool. And let's look at a brief example of this. So we can actually look at all the packets here. So this is a packet from a client to the server. So it, the way to read this diagram is you have the, we have the source port here. So 13.987 to port 22. Port 22, I think a good fraction of you have already used. So that's the SSH port. Uh, so if you've SSH into the PONE uh, 365, a CSE365.io server, you've used that and you've been sending packets on that port. Um, so we're sending from 13987 to port 22, and we set our sequence number to be 6574. Again, just a random value, it doesn't really matter. 
<laughs> and the acknowledgement again doesn't matter. Why doesn't the acknowledgement matter in this packet? It's not just that there's nothing to acknowledge. That's definitely true, though. But how does the other side know that there's definitely not anything in there? What was that? I'm implicitly doing that, but I have a way of saying if the acknowledgement number is valid or not inside every packet. Not quite. It's one of the flags. Yeah, the, the act flag is zero, which means, hey, the don't worry about, there is no acknowledgement number. That's just a, a helpful thing. It's, a, it's multiple reasons, right? The reason is that it's the start of a packet, so it has to be a sin flag with no acknowledgement flag, but also the fact that there's the acknowledgement is zero means that fundamentally whatever's in that acknowledgement number is when nobody cares about. Um, cool. Okay, <clears throat> they get that packet, they respond. They say, okay, so I'm sending a packet uh, from port 22 to port 13987, and I'm setting my sequence number to be 7611, and I'm acknowledging your sequence number plus one. So I'm acknowledging 6574 uh, to 6575, and we know SYN, SYNAC, the SYN flag is set, the acknowledgement flag is set, and then the server, uh, the client will respond when they get that packet and they'll say, okay, great. From port 13987 to port 22, uh, my sequence number is 6575 and my acknowledgement number, I'm acknowledging that I saw your sequence number of 7611, I'm adding one to it. So 7612 and I'm setting the SIM flag to zero and the acknowledgement flag to one. Cool? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, so SIN, SIN, ACK, ACK, uh, three-way handshake, TCP connection. Cool. So the question now is, how do we then uh, send data? So why does SIN become zero at the end? Uh, because SIN is only to, I mean, the, the reason is because both sides have already sent their um, sequence numbers, so they don't need to synchronize their sequence numbers. So that's where that SIN synchronize comes from is when you send a sin packet you're saying hey i want to talk to you and by the way here's my sequence number all right let's then figure out how to send data Hello. okay let's continue this conversation is that good cool so now that we've actually established the communication, we can finally start sending data from one side to the other. So uh, what's the classic maybe programming thing that we want to send to test things? What would be a string that we would print out if we're doing a programming language for the first time? Yeah, hello world, thank you. Right, so let's say we want to send those strings send that string and again remember these are just bytes under the hood so uh oh, it would be really cool if i knew what all this in hex was but what we're sending is uh one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven bytes um so from the client we're going to send that uh so now what we'll do so now that the communication is established right so you have establishment of the communic of the connection the three-way handshake, sin, sin, ack, ack. Now we can start sending data. So now the server, um, and the server technically can do this as part of their sin, ack, and you'll see this in examples, uh, but for now we'll, we'll separate them. Um, so <clears throat> let's say client wants to send this, hello world, which is 11 bytes. So they will send this back and they will have uh, data. So the data of the TCP packet will be 11 bytes. Uh, it will be the bytes, hello world. Okay. 
So does the, so think about who knows what at this stage. So the client, does the client know that they're trying to send 11 bytes to the server? Yeah, they initiated this. The application asked the operating system, great, I'd like to send the string, the bytes, hello space world to the other side. So the operating system takes that. It says, great, okay, I'm gonna send an IP packet. Uh, I'm gonna send a packet to uh, 42, uh, 8.8.8.8 on port 80 from 192.168.01 on port 42.42. And I'm gonna send the data hello world. Now, at this point, does the client know that the server got this packet or not? No, it's just sent it, right? What has to happen fundamentally for the server, for the client to know that the server got it? We need some kind of acknowledgement back, right, from that other side. We need the other side to tell us, hey, I saw that data. So, so the next thing that hopefully happens if uh, everything's working right in the world. So the server receives packet, this packet that just got sent. And the server then responds. So the server will send back a TCP packet. The source port is 80. Destination port is 4242. Flags, will it set the SIN flag? Just acknowledgement, right? SIN is only the first two packets of the connection. So the sequence number now, so now what's, what's the sequence number that the server is going to send? Has the server sent any data to the client? Yeah, this, it has not. So it will just say, hey, the last thing I sent you was sequence of server plus one of my sequence number. So actually this is a, another mechanism where the other side, when it gets that packet says, oh great, I, um, that's uh, what I've seen as well. So it knows that it's, it's synchronizing what it's sent. So it will send that. I think this will be clear as we go through here. It will then acknowledge. So how much data has it seen so far from the other side? Eleven bytes. So it'll say, "All right, since we started talking at the sequence number of the client plus one, I have seen up till sequence of the client number plus one plus eleven bytes. That's what I've seen so far." That's unfortunate. There we go plus 11 and we don't have anything to send to, this, to the client. Well, let's say we do. What, what's our response to hello world? What do you want to say back? Hello. Hmm? Hello. Okay, how many bytes is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 bytes. Oh, goodbye world, that's sad, all right. And this will be in a, I, this will be wrapped around an IP header. And this is coming from 8.8.8. Zero one. Okay. Now the client gets it. So we're not even going over what happens if uh, things are dropped or not got or whatever. We don't care. We'll deal with that in a second. So the server receives that packet. And now it has to respond and acknowledge, right? Because again, the server sent us data and the server won't know that we got that data until we respond to it, right? So, but now at this point, we got this packet back from the server. What do we know about the server state and view of the world? So once we get this packet back, what do we know that the server has seen? We know it's seen hello world. We know it's seen because of this acknowledgement number, it's seen 11 bytes that we've sent and we can check and know how many bytes we've sent. 
And we say, great, we've sent the 11 bytes. Now we can actually, as the operating system, we can tell the application, I sent that data. The other side received it. Right, which is great when you're programming because then you know when you're sending data to another remote system, you know that they receive that data. Okay. But because the other side sent us data, it means that we need to acknowledge. So let's say we don't have any data to send right now. So we'll send a packet source port 4242, destination port 80, flags, ACK. Now the sequence number here. So what's the sequence number that that we have as the client? What's our sequence number? Say it again. Yeah, let's do plus one plus 11 so that we can see that the plus one was part of the initial connection. And then we'll see that that way we know we did that plus the 11 that we've already sent. Why don't we increment this anymore? Yeah, the initial increment is just to establish those baselines going forward. And now once the connection's established, we only increment that when we've actually sent the other side data. All right, cool. Uh, what are we acknowledging? What have we seen on the other side? It's 12, so I think, unless I counted wrong. And we'll send empty data, so we don't need to send anything. Source IP 192.168.01. Cool, the server gets this, and now what does the server know? Yeah, the client sent received those 12 bytes. So then the server can then tell its application, I sent those bytes, like you are good. You don't need to worry anymore. And then maybe depending on that, it will respond and it will just go back and forth like this. Each side, every time anyone sends data, the other side will respond and acknowledge and potentially send new data, which the other side then has to respond to and acknowledge. Do you have to acknowledge an empty data packet like this? No, because this is just acknowledging that the client saw our our, the data that we're sending. So right now, both states, everybody knows exactly what everyone else has seen. So yeah, so basically, yeah, we don't need to worry about the transmission window. So uh, following the other example, right? So the client sending a packet from 13987 to port 22 and saying, uh, yeah, so sending 25 bytes. So its sequence number is 6575. The acknowledgement number is 7612. The ACK is one. So when the server gets this, it goes, oh, data, great. I need to reply. So what is the server going to acknowledge? What's the acknowledgement number going to be? You can say the formula. You don't have to do the math. Yeah, it should be 6,600. So it should be 6575 plus 25. I hope so. Ooh, good. I can't because, anyways, oh, I guess I can see, but the presenter, the Zoom thing is blocking the screen. Anyways, um, so the server will reply and say, okay, from port 22 to port 39, uh, 13987, I'm, my sequence number is 7612. So, what this is saying is what I've sent to you so far is 7612, which we know the client also knows because it acknowledged 7612. So we know we're all synced up there. Um, and we're acknowledging, hey, I've seen up till byte 6600 and I'm acknowledging. And uh, oh, also I'm sending 30 bytes. 
So what will the client then send as its acknowledgement number? Seven, six, four, two. And what will it set as it, its sequence number? Yeah, 6600. Zero, zero. So it should be from 13987 to port 22, sequence number 6600, zero, zero, acknowledgement number 67642. Uh, and so at this point, then we've exchanged data. So now both sides know that the data was sent. So let's go through some scenarios to see why this is useful. So let's say that um, this packet is dropped. So the hello world packet never got sent. This is super annoying. Not you all, but the situation. All right, how do I? So let's say the way I can just like X this out that there is format. No, we're just gonna delete it. Okay. And we can, so the other nice thing that we didn't mention is uh, we can actually send multiple packets. So we can use this to send multiple packets. So I can send hello world, and then I can send um, uh, how are you? And so I'm sending two packets without getting a reply. That's perfectly fine. I don't need to wait. That's part of the TCP window and everything of how much data can I actually send at once. Um, doesn't really matter. For our purposes here, we can see that, OK, but let's think about this. So I sent hello. H E L L O space W O R O R L D. So, what should be my sequence number here? Where does this data of how space R space U question mark start at? It'd be plus 11, right? Because it's after. So, I first sent 11 bytes. And then after that, starting at 11 is the next bytes. So, the next data that I want to send. So I'm going to send both of these packets at once. Uh, let's say this never makes it there. So it's a bad packet. It gets dropped, but the second one makes it there, right? Because just like we said, does IP guarantee that if I send two packets one after the other, they will get there in that order? Or does it guarantee that either of them will be delivered or they won't be duplicated, right? These are all instances of the same thing. So the server gets this. How should I acknowledge this packet? What is me as the server? What do I think their sequence number should be? Should just be client plus one. So I respond. So I receive this packet. Uh, let's say, just to be clear, internet drops packet one, server receives packet two. So we'll actually respond back and say, and I let's say I'm not sending any data, but we'll respond back. We get this packet. And actually, technically what happens is we'll probably store that data in a buffer. So we'll probably have a buffer and we'll say, all right, at offset 11, put those bytes in there. But I know I can't acknowledge that I've seen those bytes yet because I don't know what happened, I don't know what comes before that. Um, and that's when I said, pack, like uh, networking is confusing, is uh, complicated because there's all these kind of details of how it actually works, how you make it fast, how you make it uh, perform well. Um, but ignoring that for now, what we reply back is, hey, uh, the last thing I saw from you was sequence of client plus one. Because if we go back to this, the last thing I saw was sequence of client plus one. Uh, actually, all the way back. Yeah, all the way back here. That's what I expect the next byte to be. And so now the client receives that packet. So what does the client then know at this point? It, 
it uh yeah it actually doesn't know if the first one made it or the second one didn't make it like it just knows that the other side hasn't seen any of the data that it was trying to send so that those first two packets it just knows huh the server so i'm here or i think i've sent uh I, we didn't do the size of this one, but I think I've sent 11 plus, uh, how are you? So what's that? Three, three, uh, six, nine, 10, 11, 12. So 11 plus 12 data, that's how much I've sent. But the server's telling me I haven't sent any of that. So shoot, maybe both of them got lost. Maybe something happened. So we'll actually resend those packets. And, and maybe it didn't get there yet uh, because uh, so it will then basically send this data again. And then let's say it gets it gets uh, both of them, let's say. So the internet technically it will respond to each one. But let's say, uh, you know, so now what am I acknowledging that I've seen once I've received both those packets? Yeah, I'm acknowledging one plus 11 for the first one plus 12. And then as soon as the client gets that, it goes great. What if the client never gets this acknowledgement? What if that packet gets dropped? This is the crazy thing you have to reason about when you're talking about networks. Every packet in the communication, you have to think, what if that gets dropped? Yeah, it will, uh, the client uh, didn't know that the other side got it. And so there's usually a, a retransmission timeout. So after a certain amount of time, the client will send that data to the server again. So we would send those two packets again. And then finally, when that message came back that like, no, no, I'm acknowledging I've got, I've seen it all, trust me, like I've got it. And then at that point, then now they're up to, um, uh, what's it, 23. So sequence of client plus one plus 23. They know that we're both there, we've both seen it, great. And now we can move forward. And this is how um, it kind of gets back on track. So uh, yeah, so, and this is actually uh, what you need to know to be dangerous as we'll, uh, I guess, see next week. I was hoping to get to that today, but, um, but you know, how TCP works is a very important thing. Um, and shutting down the connection is very simple. Uh, either one can say, hey, I'm done talking. So they will send a, uh, terminate its side of the connection and say, hey, I want to stop talking. I'm going to send a fin packet. The other one will acknowledge, right? We'll send an act packet back because again, it's the same thing. How do I know that the other side got my request to stop talking, right? So you send a request to stop talking. They need to acknowledge that. And then at that point, I know that they know that I don't, I'm not going to send them any information. And from that point, A will never send any data to B. Uh, it'll just acknowledge data sent by B. So when B sends it any additional data, it will have to acknowledge that back. And then B, when B wants to shut down and B sends a fin packet, then the, um, the circuit is closed. So just to kind of complete the life cycle, sin, sin, act, a bunch of sequence and acknowledgement numbers going back and forth. And then finally at the end, some fins uh, to finish everything up. Uh, okay, yeah, so the, so here in this example, the client, uh, to finish our example here, uh, 13987 will send a packet to port 22, sequence number 693, uh, 6983. So they've been talking for a while, I think we can see from the sequence numbers here. Um, they're acknowledging that they've seen 8777, setting the SIN flag. The server will acknowledge that and said, great, the last thing I saw from you was 6984. Well, I don't know if that's a mistake or not. I'll have to look that up. I don't know if the final acknowledgement number is added one to. I guess that would make sense because you're acknowledging that you've actually seen that fin packet since they're not sending you any data. I guess that would be my um, my thought there. Um, 
Cool. Okay. And then we're sending uh, 30 bytes from the server to the client. The cl and then the server can send a fin packet to say, all right, so I've sent uh, 8807. So that's the previous sequence number plus 30. And I'm done talking. So I don't need to talk anymore. And they will finally acknowledge that final one and say, okay, I'm acknowledging that my sequence number is 6984. And I'm acknowledging I've seen up to 8808. Yeah, it must be this plus, this plus one lets you know that uh, you're actually acknowledging the fit. Um, so there's an additional plus one at the end. And at this point, it's done. Tore down, no connections. Let's take this opportunity to look at some stuff. Uh, um, okay. You can't see that. Uh, since we were talking about it, let's see. Uh, so the options I'm using here on TCP dump, uh, the dash N is to not, by default TCP dump and other tools will try to, when they see an uh, IP address, we'll try to do a reverse DNS name lookup and that can slow things down significantly. So N just says, show me the numbers. Don't show me any, don't try to translate anything into the names. The I option says the, um, what uh, network interface to use. So you can use IF config or uh, anything like that to figure out what your interfaces are. I already know my wireless one is this. I can set an option of, I want port 80 or port, uh, let's do port 22. Uh, and what happens when I SSH into a uh, hacker? Yes, yeah, so we can see a ton of stuff happens here. All right. So we can uh, look at this. So this is my current IP address is 10.153.30.83. And this is the port. So this is kind of the weird TCP dump way output of showing that. So this is the IP address and then dot port. So from source port uh, 54511 uh, to 13.56.97.136 port 22. Uh, if we want to ask, we can say dig. Uh, so dig is the DNS resolving. So this will make a DNS query. And this says, okay, pwn cse365.io is located at this IP address. So we can see that it's the correct IP address here. Port 22, setting the SYN flag. My sequence number, and let me uh, change this a bit to make it more legible. Uh, my sequence number is this insane big number. Uh, a bunch of windows, options, all kinds of stuff that is happening, the operating systems, like uh, optimizing these things for data transmission and reducing data loss is really important. Uh, then we see the packet come back from 13.56.97.136, port 22 to 10, 153.30.83, port 5.45.11. Sin and the dot here is the ACK flag. And we can see the other side sending us its sequence number. And we should know that this should be 80 at the end because it should be, the acknowledgement should be plus one. So the ACK here is correct. It's 80. It's sending us windows, options, whatever. And then we finally send an ACK back. So that's the flag there, the ACK. And we're acknowledging, and at this point, um, because we've got the two random uh, values here, so we've started with random sequence numbers, then after that TCP dump uh, normalizes them based on there. So rather than do it showing like the se initial sequence number plus one, it just shows you the one and then the two, and then that way it's a lot easier to read. So I can see that uh, here I'm acknowledging and I'm sending a length zero packet. The other side then sends uh, the P packet, here's the push. So the remote server sends us a push of 21 bytes. And, and then we acknowledge we've seen up to 22. Um, oh, and the sequence number here, it's doing one colon 22. So it's interpreting the length and saying, even though it's technically not in the packet itself to help you, it's saying this data is from byte one to byte 22. So it starts at one, it's uh, 21, length 21. So we're acknowledging we've seen up to 22 and we're acting and then we push data. So then we're pushing and sending data uh, from, oh, I got the from and source back mixed up. This is us, sorry. 
this is us. We are sending 21 bytes. They acknowledge that they've seen those. And then they're sending us uh, 41 bytes. So in response to whatever those bytes were that we sent, we can actually, if we do the full, um, I think it's dash X option will show us the, yeah. so X will actually show us the raw bytes of these packets. Um, and we can see that I don't have to worry about showing you all this data. You can't like break my stuff because this, the whole point of this encryption is that I can SSH into the server. Even if you're watching my communication, you can't uh, break into it, but you can actually see that a lot of stuff is transmitted. So this is what I was saying about, um, all the different negotiations of ciphers and how they're doing everything. This is all this stuff means like, you know, you learned about some of this stuff, Divi Hellman, uh, SHA-256, right? All these different hash and crypto stuff. Um, it's telling us that it's SSH open SSH, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, so lots of stuff going on until it finally establishes the connection. Actually, let's let's do that real quick. Doing a lot of stuff. <sighs> Start a challenge, all right, fine. It's not port 22 SSH. There we go. So now, okay. So now you can see we're at a state here where no packets are being sent. Every time I type in a letter, L S space dash L A enter, right? Packets are getting sent. So this is actually how SSH works under the hood. Every time you type something, it's sending data to the server and then getting the response back and updating your terminal with what it got sent. So kind of cool. And I can show you all this because it's all encrypted gibberish. So you can't actually read it, which is good. All right, that's it.